On July 4, 2006, Space Shuttle Discovery launched STS-121 to deliver supplies, equipment, and European Space Agency astronaut Thomas Reiter from Germany to the International Space Station. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, go for main engine start, main engine start, 2, 1, booster ignition, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery, returning to the space station, paving the way for future missions beyond. Discovery the space shuttle begins the journey back into orbit. Discovery completes its role. The shuttle now heads down wings level for the eight and a half minute line to orbit. Camera Several cameras watched the launch for any irregularities, specifically foam coming from the external tank. The video from these was not to be broadcast, but recorded for later retrieval from the solid rocket boosters. A further camera was placed on the external tank, as was during STS 114 to broadcast live images on NASA TV during the launch. Discovery already three and a half miles in altitude, one and a half miles downrange, traveling almost 750 miles an hour. Everything looking good on the bird. 57 seconds into the flight, engines beginning to rev up. Standing by for the throttle up call from Capcom Steve Frick. Throttle up call acknowledged by Commander Steve Lindsay. And Discovery Houston, it's expected day to hit Tittle Clear shortly. Copy. Lindsay joined on the flight deck by pilot Mark Kelly, flight engineer Lisa Nowak, and mission specialist Mike Fossum. Mission specialists Pierce Sellers, Stephanie Wilson, and Tomas Ryder of the European Space Agency down on the mid deck. Ryder headed for six months on the International Space Station. One minute, 47 seconds into the flight, 22 miles in altitude, 18 miles downrange, traveling 2,600 miles an hour, standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Solid rocket booster separation confirmed, guidance now converging. Discovery's onboard computers commanding the main engine nozzles to swivel, aiming the shuttle for its precise target in space for main engine cutoff. And we should have a good forward leg now on s -Bend. And you sound good. Discovery soon will be rolling to a heads-up position through the swiveling of its main engines, enabling the shuttle to gain more favorable communications through the tracking and data relay satellite as it heads uphill. Houston, press to ATO, select history. Roger, press ATO, selecting Istris. Discover Houston, single engine, OPS 3. Single engine, OPS 3. Those calls indicating that we can make our uh, minimal orbital cutoff targets in the event of a dual engine failure. Roll to heads up uh, in the plain view of this camera on the liquid oxygen feed line. Everything looking good for Discovery, six minutes, 11 seconds into the flight. Discovery Houston, single engine Istris 104. Roger, single engine Istris 104. That call indicating that we can make our uh, transoceanic abort targets in the event of a dual engine failure. However, all three engines on Discovery continue to function normally, along with the auxiliary power units and the fuel cells. Six minutes, 40 seconds into the flight, two minutes of powered flight remaining for Discovery. Discovery Houston, press to Miko. We show a nominal shutdown plan. Your go for the plus X and go for the pitch maneuver. The booster officer reports that we have main engine cutoff standing by for external tank separation. External tank separation confirmed. 
Commander Steve Lindsay now maneuvering Discovery to the correct orientation so that video and digital stills of the external tank can be captured by cameras embedded in the shuttle's umbilical well. A smooth ride to orbit for the shuttle Discovery embarking on what is expected to be a 13-day mission. During the standard two-day rendezvous orbit, the crew used the 50-foot-long orbiter boom sensor system, or the OBSS, which is tipped with two types of lasers and a high-resolution television camera to inspect the underside of the shuttle for damage, particularly the leading edge of the wings. The launch director said he saw bird droppings on that location before the launch. Two days after launch, on July 6, 2006, Discovery approached the station and performed the new safety inspection pitch-over maneuver to allow the station crew to film the shuttle thermal protection and schedule any on-orbit repairs. And eventually we get underneath the space station about 600 miles, directly underneath it. And at that point we have to do this pitch maneuver. The reason we do this is so the space station crew could take some pictures of the bottom side of Discovery. So this is now us upside down, can't see anything, and we're kind of doing this in the blind, but uh, we have some pretty good expectations of what's going to happen. Uh, eventually we flip all the way over, and um, now our nose is about pointed towards the ground. Uh, if you, pr you probably guess this is sped up a little, and it is, I think by about 10 times. Um, when we saw the space station coming over the tail, we were all pretty happy about that because you like to see it show up where you expect. It would be bad if it was uh, in a different place, and this is Pavel and Jeff talking about what they saw um, right before we docked. Um, we eventually get in front of the space station, and we uh, slowly approach it, and initially it's flown by the computers, but later as we get closer, uh, Steve will manually fly the docking, by looking out the window and looking through some cameras. And that's a space station on top and the space shuttle on the bottom. And they come together at about a tenth of a foot per second. So uh, pretty slow, that's, that's sped up there a little bit too. Not, not all that much. And then we'll uh, bring those two surfaces together and pressurize the vacuum that's between the two vehicles. And um, oh, these guys were happy we didn't hit too hard. <laughs> Thomas Ryder officially became a member of the International Space Station Expedition 13 crew shortly after docking when they transferred his personalized Soyuz spacecraft seat liner, which is the indicated official transfer point. After joining the station, the crew moved a multi-purpose logistic module called Leonardo to the Nadir port of Node 1 to allow for the transfer of equipment, supplies, and to return experiments and trash. We're maneuvering the uh, logistics module up out of the shuttle payload bay to install it on the uh, node nader port on the station. We install it and then ungrapple and maneuver the st shuttle arm, the station arm away, I'm sorry, for, uh, for that operation. Three spacewalks were carried out during STS-121. Michael Fossum and Pierce Sellers performed a seven and a half hour spacewalk where they evaluated the use of the 50 foot orbital boom sensor system extension as a work platform in case repairs are needed for the shuttle. Uh, all told, that's 100, uh, 100 foot of arm and boom. Uh, Piers went out solo first for some tests, and then the two of us went out to do, uh, first we were, uh, we affectionately called it bouncing on the boom. Uh, here's a view from Piers' helmet, kind of looking back at the orbiter, gives you an idea of what kind of a spectacular view you have. It got a little distracting at times. On the second EVA, Sellers and Fossum performed a six hour and 47 minute spacewalk where they deployed a spare pump module and replaced a reel of umbilical cable carrying power, data, and video for operating the station's mobile transporter rail car. The astronauts also continued cargo transfers between the shuttle and the International Space Station with the Leonardo Multipurpose Logistics Module. Leonardo arrived with more than 74,000 pounds of equipment and supplies for the station, 
and would eventually be returned back into the payload bay with more than 43,000 pounds of science experiments results, unneeded items, and other trash. But uh, here's a shot of a zero-gravity stowage rack being transferred. It's a soft uh, rack, and it houses the supplies inside. Uh, it takes a couple of people to transfer through the, uh, through the hatchway. And that's a crew transfer bag. Uh, we bring uh, supplies from the shuttle also to the airlock and uh, into the lab. A third and final spacewalk to demonstrate shuttle repair techniques was carried out by Sellers and Fossum. Repairs were done on pre-damaged samples of heat shield materials brought into space in a special pallet in the payload bay of the shuttle. The repairs were expected to work best when the period has been warm but is cooling, so the actions were carefully coordinated by mission control with regard to exposure of the samples to the sun. And the third EVA was about doing this big, pretty important experiment, very important experiment. It was very successful. And what this experiment was about was to see if we could fix the heat shield on the leading edge of the orbiter, the reinforced carbon-carbon. So we had a bunch of tools to do that, a bunch of bags with a bunch of tools in it, and we had this really big box all the way in the back of the payload bay. And uh, here you can see what uh, one of the bags of tools look like. There's really a lot of stuff in there, and um, most of it is, is tied down or, or, or kept in place. Um, and then we, then we have uh, some samples, and on these samples, this is a uh, this is uh, pieces of wing, essentially, and a putty knife and some putty. And this putty is called Noax, and it's pretty good at absorbing heat uh, and actually dissipating heat. Um, what was that, Mike? <laughs> uh, this is the EVA IR camera, uh, which we tested outside as well. And I think this is, uh, this is Piers here. So you can see some of the uh, joints on his spacesuit where uh, heat's, heat's coming out of. Um, this EVA lasted about seven hours, and uh, just last week, we uh, tested these samples and they worked great. After the last spacewalk, the STS-121 crew enjoyed a day off. Expedition 13 crew member Jeffrey Williams confirmed steps and final procedures for the closeout of the MPLM which then crew members Wilson and Nowak used Canada Arm 2 to relocate the MPLM from the Navy Report of Unity to Discovery's Payload Bay. We maneuver uh, the logistics module down into the Payload Bay and uh, berth it for return home with all of the return items. And uh, prior to flight, Lisa and I were dubbed the Robo Chicks and Piers was kind enough to uh, do some space art for us, so we decided to show it off. Well, we had a great time, but then it's time to go. So here's some farewells, everyone uh, saying goodbye. And you know, we think uh, they were really glad to see us when we got there. And then we think that they were really glad to see us go. We, had, we uh, kept everybody really busy. And uh, I think Jeff said the night after we left, he got about 12 hours of sleep. After nine days of joint operations, Discovery undocked from the International Space Station on July 15, 2006, while flying just north of New Zealand. And no time to rest. We're busy and it's time to do the undock. You can see inside, just like on the rendezvous, it's pretty crowded. Uh, Mark is at the controls now. You can see just behind his head, you can see uh, the actual uh, beginning of the undock taking place. And there it is from the outside. So we're watching out those overhead windows and mark at the controls. Astronaut Mark Kelly then flew Discovery to a point above the station before performing the final separation burn. And you could still look out the window and see the station getting farther and farther away. And we had lots of things to put away, all the, all the things we had gotten out uh, during the mission, all those EVA things. and. Uh, a lot of the transfer items, a lot of things still need to be put away, so we kept busy doing that uh, for the next day until it's getting ready, time to come home. While in orbit, crew members also used the Canada Arm and the orbital boom sensor system to perform final inspections of the starboard wing and the shuttle nose cap, looking for any damage that might have been caused by orbital debris while docked to the station. Discovery received a clean bill of health 
and was given a go for landing. Atmospheric reentry and landing at Kennedy Space Center Shuttle Landing Facility Runway 15 occurred on July 17, 2006. You see the little flash out the overhead windows in the upper left of your screen, and that's uh, plasma flashes as the atmosphere around us uh, is basically on fire because of the heat. There's uh, the view out the front, and you can see the glow. If you uh, go about four to 10 feet in front, temperature is all the way up to as hot as 10,000 degrees out there. Um, but that's what our, your shields are designed to protect us from. And here we are coming into entry, and at about 50,000 feet, I'll take over manually to fly the vehicle. And this is looking out. Uh, the heads-up display out the front, what Mark and I are looking at, you see the runway out there. Um, we'll come in in a steep dive, and at about uh, 300 feet here, Mark's going to drop the gear. And the goal is to land this at about, uh, oh, 200, 210 miles an hour, about 2,500 feet down the runway, and, uh, and hopefully land like an airliner and, uh, and not hurt anybody or hurt the wheels when I land. So coming for a landing, I did land at KSC for the fourth time, so that I was one out of two. Um, and came in and land and there's the wheels touching down right about there and then uh, the next thing we do is uh, is mark deploys a drag chute and that just slows us down a little bit and we'll lower the nose to the runway uh, get on the brakes to slow us down and uh, and come to a stop after uh, it was about 12 days 18 hours about 13 day mission there we are rolling to a stop and uh, on another nice morning at uh, Kennedy Space Center and uh, after we get stopped, we'll have about another hour of work to do inside the vehicle, uh, do some more switches and some more work, make sure the vehicle is safe uh, uh, for them, and then the ground crew approaches us, and eventually we get off the vehicle, and uh, there we are at the end, a, a very happy and very exhausted crew. The second spacewalk for the Expedition 13 crew occurred around August 3rd, 2006. The spacewalk was performed by Jeffrey Williams and Thomas Reiter, and lasted more than 5 hours and 54 minutes. During the spacewalk, the astronauts installed the floating potential measurement unit, installed experiments, controllers, computers, and other components outside the station. The STS-121 mission was the final return to flight for the shuttle, and the orbiter was now ready to continue building the station.